It's electric. Deed. Electronic shifting. It's been around for a while now, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And with more budget options becoming available, I thought it was finally time to talk about electronic shifting in relation to bikepacking. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this video. Hey everybody, thanks again for checking us out. And if you like what you see in our videos, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And there is a way to support us a little bit more, and that is by signing up for the Bikepacking Collective. The Bikepacking Collective is bikepacking.com's annual membership. For more details, I've provided a link below. As always, thank you all so much for the support. When I started seriously cycling over 10 years ago, one by 11 drivetrains were just becoming a thing. Three buys were still a thing. Dropper posts were just being launched, and there definitely wasn't much in the way of electronic shifting. 10 years later, I wouldn't have guessed that we would be talking about bikepacking and electronic shifting, but here we are. Over the past three years, I probably have used some sort of an electronic system for probably half of my bikepacking trips. Now, I know there's a lot of folks that simply would never consider an electronic system for any of their bikes, let alone bikepacking. And if you are of that camp, well, this video, it might not interest you, but I assure you, I'm also not 100% sold on the idea, but I do think it's fair to highlight some of the upsides so that folks can make an educated decision on whether or not electronic shifting is right for them and their bikepacking trips. So what is electronic shifting? Well, essentially electronic shifting takes away the mechanical aspect of your drivetrain. It doesn't use traditional cable and housing in which the shifter actuates the derailleur via the cable. There's a variety of different systems out there, some wireless, some Wired. So I think it's time to talk about mm, what's available out there. For starters, Campagnola or Campy came out with their EPS system. And while it looks nice, I have not tested it, nor do I have plans on testing it due to the fact that A, it's super expensive, but B, the gearing is just not very friendly for bikepacking. If you're really into road cycling or if you're a diehard Campagnola fan, well, this system will probably play well with you. Another option is Archer, and Archer uses their D1X electronic system, and this is a really unique system in the fact that it allows you to use the mechanical derailleur that you have paired with their electronic shifting box. This system is definitely more unique because it's not 100% electric. But if you want to learn a little bit more about Archer's electronic system, there's a link below. Miles did a review on it. All right, now talking about SRAM. SRAM has their ETAP access and access electronic systems. These systems use an encrypted wireless network for the components to talk to each other. The derailers of the system also come with a rechargeable and replaceable small little battery. And the shifter also has a tiny little battery in it as well. I would say all of SRAM's electronic drivetrain systems, they're the most clean out there. And finally, talking about Shimano's DI2 system, Digital Integrated Intelligence, hence I2. Yeah. DI2 has been around for a while, and actually it's been around longer than any other system out there. The system uses E-tubes and junction boxes to connect to your battery, your derailleurs, and your shifters. Just hearing that out of my voice, it's definitely a little bit more of a complicated system, but there is some upside, and we'll get into that. So going forward in this video, I'm gonna reference the DI2 and the SRAM access system because, well, those are the only two systems that I've used. All right, so likely the biggest talking point for bike packers and electronic shifting is the battery. And yes, if these batteries die on you, well, so does your drivetrain. Obviously not all of these systems are created equally. You can just see right here, this is the Shimano DI2 battery, and this is your access battery. I've done a handful of week-long trips with the Shimano DI2 GRX system, and I've actually had really good luck with it. I'll typically get six days of use before having to recharge the battery with this two by GRX DI2 system. It may be a more extreme case. In 2016, the late Mike Hall set the tour divide record on a DI2 one by. Even though I'm sure he charged his DI2 system over the course of 13 and a half days, it's impressive nonetheless because of how much pedaling he actually did. In 2019, I was in Washington and I was doing a very single track focused 
bikepacking trip, and I ended up getting 36 and a half hours out of one rear derailleur battery. On the flip side of that, in the fall of 2019, I ended up doing a race which ended up taking me 30 hours, and I only got 17 hours out of this rear battery before I had to replace it. So clearly, battery life is very dependent on a number of factors, like the rider, the pace that they're going, and the shifting tendencies. If you have a front and rear derailleur, if you're pairing them up with a number of different accessories and so on. But when these batteries do start to fade, your drivetrain will give you hints so that you can prepare. So a few hints might be your DI2 system, your front derailleur quits working. The red light starts to turn on on your access system. Or if you paired a cycling computer with your electronic system, oftentimes you'll get a low battery warning. Although it still might take a handful of hours before the battery actually dies, the downside here is it almost puts me in a more defensive position in which I try to not shift as much, and I also try to make sure that I'm always in a neutral gear so that when it does die, I actually have a bike that I can pedal. But say your battery does die, not all is lost. The beauty of these electronic systems is, well, we'll get into extra batteries or bringing extra batteries along with you, but you can also use your resources. So say you have an access front derailleur or an access dropper post, and those aren't dead, but your rear derailleur is dead, well, you can always just swap batteries over to make sure that you actually have more shifting capabilities. Another option is using your friend's DI2 battery just so that you can put yourself in a more proper gear so that you can actually climb up that hill. If there's one thing that surprised me more than anything out of these electronic systems, it has been battery life. So similar to bringing a cable for your mechanical systems, having a way to charge your batteries on your electronic systems is necessary, or at least a very good idea. Some might bring a cache battery so that they can use their chargers to charge their batteries. Others might just bring some spare access or ETAP batteries along with them. And maybe in a more extreme case, some might bring the Shimano Di2 battery. After all, it's really not that heavy, it's just a little bit larger. While bringing these proprietary chargers can be very helpful, they also can be cumbersome. And that's why with this access system, all I do is just bring a variety of these batteries because it's super easy to actually replace the battery on the derailleur. Unlike the DI2 system, it definitely takes a little bit more effort to replace because this is typically within your seat post or somewhere in your frame, but this will definitely last a lot longer than this. Another system that many people already use is a dynamo hub or a generator hub in which you actually are generating power while cycling. And this is super nice because it helps you be more self-sustained. And with the DI2 system, you can actually be pedaling your bike, generating power, plugging in that charger into the charge port of your DI2 system and charge your battery that way. Pretty neat. Water and electricity, eh, they typically don't get along. And yes, there is risk of water penetrating these electronic systems and causing them to fail. There's also a risk of completely ripping your e-tube, perhaps losing a battery or the connection of your battery, or even just losing the wireless signal from your shifter to your derailleur. I've heard of all of these things actually happening, but with that said, I've never had that stuff happen to me personally. And I've tested basically the limits of these two electronic systems. I've completely submerged them in water, ridden through plenty of disgusting terrain and weather and cold temperatures, and have still yet to have one of these systems fail me. Mechanical drivetrains, well, they're also prone to failure, whether it's the part inside a shifter or the cable itself, or perhaps you crash, bend your derailleur hanger, and in turn, snap your chain because the shifting is completely out of whack. That can actually be avoided with the overlord clutch on these access rear derailleurs. And DI2 has something a little bit similar with their crash recovery mode, in which it basically prevents any further damage in the event of a crash or a strike to the derailleur. So as far as durability is concerned, I've broken a mechanical drop bar lever, I've broken a mechanical flat bar shifter, and I've broken a electronic shifter. So just a little note here, I ended up breaking my DI2 GRX front derailleur shifter. And because of the DI2 synchro setting, I was able to shift through every single one of my gears 
using this right shifter lever. And if you lose, break, or just run out of battery at your access shifter, you can always lean down and shift your derailleur manually. So stuff happens, but I wouldn't say electronic shifting is more prone to failure in my experience. But what I would say is that the DI2 system has more things, thus more things to break. And the DI2 system often has junction box B hidden in the frame, oftentimes in areas that make it really challenging to access during a bikepacking trip. Wireless shifting, if set up properly, is more smooth, more crisp, and just more more reliable than a mechanical system. And because of this, it reduces wear and tear on your drivetrain. It also doesn't have a break-in period like a mechanical system does. Cables, they stretch. But it is important that the electronic system is set up properly because if it isn't, well, you're just gonna wear out your components that much faster. I also think it's important to mention that there is no cable or housing associated with electronic system. Raise your hand if you've had some sort of damage due to your cable and housing. I know I have, and it's a little frustrating. I've ruined some frames that way. And yes, you still have brake lines and for some instances, electronic cables, but negotiating around cables and housing for shifting and bikepacking bags, it's always been a struggle. So not having those is super beneficial. So when talking about adjusting your drivetrain with a mechanical system, the first thing that you would do is adjust your barrel. Super easy. With electronic systems, it's a little bit more complex and there definitely is a learning curve. Once you figure out your electronic system, using the micro adjustments is as easy as the press of a button or two. And I find that it is more precise than a barrel. So overall, with electronic systems, you won't ever have to replace cable and housing, and you'll rarely, if ever, have to replace an e-tube. And once you dial in your drivetrain, it's going to be set for a very long time, if not forever. After long days in the saddle over multiple days, using your hands to shift your bike can definitely lead to some fatigue. I've dealt with this on drop and flat bar mechanical shifters before because the action of actually shifting that shifter takes a little bit more effort. And doing that thousands upon thousands of times a day definitely adds up. But with electronic shifting, it is super easy. With this DI2 GRX system, I actually almost all the time just shift with my pinky, especially when I'm in the hoods like this because it's super convenient. There's no way that I'd be able to shift with my pinky with a mechanical system, especially over a full day. And the axis shifter itself kind of reminds me of a mechanical shifter, but it's so much easier to engage. Finding replacement parts for any bikepacking trip is definitely not something that you want to deal with but finding electronic parts is definitely going to be more of a challenge because it's definitely a newer thing. But I think the same can be said for some mechanical parts as well, especially in different parts of the world. I know Logan just had some issues with a 12 speed chain and he couldn't actually find a replacement in Mexico so he had to figure things out. And that is something that you should probably expect. In general, I wouldn't be carrying an extra shifter, an extra derailleur. I wouldn't do that with a mechanical system, so I wouldn't do it with an electronic system. What I would bring is some, obviously, some extra batteries for the access system, an extra CR2032 battery for the shifter, and for a DI2 system, I would bring an extra long E-tube. In the event that the whole system fails, I can route it externally and have a functioning rear derailleur. Obviously, each one of these electronic systems is unique to itself. Installing the DI2 system is definitely going to be more challenging than installing your access system. Comparing the install process of an electronic system to a mechanical system, at least as far as the derailleur is concerned, there's still limit screws on an electronic system. There's still B-tension screws. You need to make sure that that is all dialed in. Another thing that might be a hurdle for some is using the associated applications, whether they be web apps or phone apps with their devices. And while this is something I truly enjoy because these manufacturers give you the ability to set up different shifting preferences, I know not everybody likes to use these smartphones. And another annoying thing with the DI2 system is you need a wireless dongle so that your system can actually pair with your phone. Otherwise, you have to plug it into your computer. One of the really neat features of electronic systems is they're consistently being updated with firmware updates. I got this SRAM XO rear derailleur right when they launched the access system. But since then, it's gone through a variety of different firmware updates to make it function better. 
So instead of having to, well, get a different rear derailleur because it's out of touch or out of date or old, these, they're consistently being updated. All right, so when would you use an electronic system and when wouldn't you? Obviously, it's personal preference and what you feel comfortable with. I guess maybe the longer the route, the more annoying it would be to charge your system. That being said, if you have a good system, if you have a dynamo hub, if you are consistently staying in hotel rooms and stuff like that, this actually might not be an issue. If you're on a world tour in the middle of nowhere, nowhere near any bike shops, especially bike shops that would have some sort of electronic replacement parts, well, you know, you might want to consider not using an electronic system. But when you're talking about week-long trips, weekend trips, or perhaps overnighters, well, these electronic systems definitely become more appealing. If I was tasked to make the ultimate electronic drivetrain, what I would do is somehow use the wireless system of the Access with the battery life of DI2, the best of both worlds, and that way I would have no issues using it for bikepacking. Electronic shifting, it's somehow complex yet very simple. One thing is for certain, it's come a long way and it's actually pretty good where it's at. But I definitely think that we're going to see more of a trickle down as far as budget electronic systems in the years to come, at least I hope so. SRAM launched this last year with the GX access system. But the reason I truly want this to happen is because I really love electronic shifting because it is so reliable and crisp but the price point is still a little bit too high. So while electronic shifting may or may not be for you, I'm truly curious to hear your thoughts. Why are you not using electronic shifting? And for folks that have used electronic shifting, what is, say, something that sets electronic shifting apart from mechanical shifting? As always, thank you all so much for watching, and until next time, pedal further.